What a fantastic first half. I'm beginning to think and feel what Alexa must be going through every day. I think I'll never swear at her again. I'm Roger and this is Bookshook and today's podcast is all about the first half of July's book Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro, published earlier this year in 2021. So the idea of the podcast is that we'll spend a month reading a book, hopefully together. I'll split the book into two equal halves and discuss the first half on the second Friday of the month and the second half on the last Friday of the month. I'll be sharing your thoughts and mine, asking loads of questions, discussing ideas, making predictions, and we'll decide what type of person we'd recommend the book to, if at all. I'd love you to read alongside. Of course, you don't have to read anything at all. You can audible or just listen to the podcast since I'll be summarising what happens. But do be aware there will be spoilers. You can leave a comment or start a conversation at the Bookshook YouTube channel or send an email to bookshook at yahoo.com. I love reading your comments. Welcome to Bookshook. So I've read up to the little square dot on page 156. If you're kindling, that should be 50%. Doesn't quite have the same romance, does it? So, Clara is introduced to us. She's an artificial friend, an AF. She's working in a store and she is new and she is alongside Rosa, who is another AF. Clara is concerned that she may run out of energy. Her colleague, Rosa, also new, says, you can crouch down to get energy from the pattern the sun makes on the floor. I was just thinking about the pattern the sun makes on the floor. There's no word for the opposite of a shadow. Quote, and this is Clara, I reached out both hands to the sun's pattern on the floor, but as soon as my fingers touched it, the pattern faded, and though I tried all I could, I patted the spot where it had been, and when that didn't work, rubbed my hands over the floorboards. It wouldn't come back. This image of an intelligent being scrabbling around on the floor is kind of uncanny. It's almost childlike in her confusion. A more experienced AF called Rex makes Clara feel like she may have sucked up all the sunlight. Although she thinks he could be joking. This is Clara talking. Quote, but you just said yourself, the sun always has ways to reach us. You're making a joke. I know you are, but she's not sure. He slumps forward pretending to be sick. And then Rex is promoted to the alcove at the front of the store where he is soon seen by a potential customer. Quote, a girl came in with her mother. I wasn't so good then at telling ages, but I remember estimating 13 and a half for the girl. And I think now that was correct. The mother was an office worker and from her shoes and suit, we could tell she was high ranking. So the story is narrated from the point of view of this AF, this artificial friend called Clara. It's interesting how precise a computer estimation of age is compared to humans. A 13 and a half, she's very good at estimating ages and she always puts in halves. And they have these built-in prejudices. So high-ranking mother, because of her shoes and suit, that's a very human quality to see someone and just think, oh yes, they are a certain class of person. And she's got all these prejudices as well. That's so that she can navigate the world, but it is a shame, isn't it? The manager tries very hard to sell Rex. The manager sees this couple looking at Rex. Quote, the manager by this time had brought herself quietly behind them. Eventually, the mother turned to manager and asked, which model is this one? He's a B2, manager said. Third series. For the right child, Rex will make a perfect companion. In particular, I feel he'll encourage a conscientious and studious attitude in a young person. Well, this young lady here could certainly do with that, says the mother. And the child says, oh, mother, he's perfect. And then the mother said, B2 third series, the ones with the solar absorption problems, right? She said it just like that in front of Rex, her smile still on her face. Rex kept smiling too, but the child looked baffled and glanced from Rex to her mother. There doesn't seem to be any feelings towards this AI from the mother. So solar absorption is pretty much everything to these AFs. It is equated to goodness in their programming. Quote, I nearly forgot about the son and his kindness to us. His kindness. Almost religious. Ishigo really brings in a moral and religious idea of good and bad kindness of the son. Rosa and Clara get their chance to be in the window, finally. 
Quote, I could see for the first time that the RPO building was in fact made of separate bricks and that it wasn't white, as I'd always thought, but a pale yellow. It's really interesting here how Clara notices details like a small child with a huge intellect discovering the world. She doesn't generalise or make assumptions like an adult human might. She notices that Rosa doesn't seem as interested or observant as she is. And Clara does seem to have a very empathetic streak. She notices when children are sad or angry when she sees them in the street. And the manager explains why. Quote, what you must understand is that we're a very special store. There are many children out there who would love to be able to choose you, choose Rosa, any one of you here, but it's not possible for them. You're beyond their reach. That's why they come to the window to dream about having you, but then they get sad. They browse these interesting magazines, Clara and Rosa, before sleep. She said that she's been observing these interesting magazines. Interesting that she hasn't been reading them. And at this stage, I'm wondering whether reading may be too powerful and is denied to the AFs. I'm not sure. I think we may find out that they can read later. But at this point in the book, I'm thinking that maybe they're not even able to read. And then we are introduced to Josie, but in a very robotic, mechanical way. Quote, Josie's eyes were on me as she got out onto the sidewalk. She was pale and thin, and as she came towards us, I could see her walk wasn't like that of other passers-by. She wasn't slow exactly, but she seemed to take stock after each step to make sure she was still safe and wouldn't fall. I estimated her age as 14 and a half. She just comes into existence. They chat between the glass of the window while Josie's mum and a friend chat in the back of the taxi. And I assume here that Clara is lip reading. Josie talks of the sun. Quote, where we live, there's nothing in the way. From up in my room, you can see exactly where the sun goes down, the exact place he goes at night. The mother appears from the taxi. Quote, she was black haired and thin, though not as thin as Josie or some of the runners. Now she was closer and I could see her face better. I raised my estimate of her age to 45. As I've said, I wasn't so accurate with ages then, but this was to prove more or less correct. From a distance, I'd first thought her a younger woman, but when she was closer, I could see the deep etches around her mouth and also a kind of angry exhaustion in her eyes. I noticed too that when Mother reached out to Josie from behind, the outstretched arm hesitated in the air, almost retracting before coming forward to rest on her daughter's shoulder. They entered the flow of passers-by, going in the direction of the second tow-away zone sign. Angry exhaustion, the hesitation of the arm. This AF is very empathetic. And I like how age seems to be so important. Perhaps because AFs are digital and they're thinking of numbers a lot. The second tow-away zone sign, again, making sense of the world through number, a very computery kind of thing to do. Usually just say a tow-away zone sign. You wouldn't say the second tow-away zone sign. I love this about her features, the way Clara thinks. Rosa notes how few AFs can be seen out and about with their children. And Clara, using her emotional intelligence or her empathy skills, notes that it's probably because those AFs don't want their children to think about newer models of AF. She's even empathetic to other AFs. Quote, this is Clara speaking. I shared none of these thoughts with Rosa. Instead, whenever we spotted an AF out there, I made a point of wondering aloud if they were happy with their child and with their home. And this always pleased and excited Rosa. She took it up as a kind of game, pointing and saying, look over there, do you see Clara? That boy just loves his AF. Oh, look at the way they're laughing together. And sure enough, there were plenty of pairs that looked happy with each other. But Rosa missed so many signals. She would often exclaim delightedly at a pair going by. And I would look and realise that even though a girl was smiling at her AF, she was in fact angry with him and was perhaps at that very moment thinking cruel thoughts about him. I noticed such things all the time but said nothing and let Rosa go on believing what she did. Clara's mind is opened to the idea of a child not loving her AF 
Listen to this, quote, A boy AF was walking three paces behind a girl, and I could see, even in that small instant, that he hadn't lagged behind by chance, that this was how the girl had decided they would always walk, she in front and he a few steps behind. The boy AF had accepted this, even though other passers-by would see and conclude he wasn't loved by the girl, and I could see the wariness in the boy AF's walk, and wondered what it might be like to have found a home, and yet to know that your child didn't want you. Until I saw this pair, it hadn't occurred to me an AF could be with a child who despised him and wanted him gone, and that they could nevertheless carry on together. Clara is desperate to learn from the street. Quote, the more I watched, the more I wanted to learn, and unlike Rosa, I became puzzled, then increasingly fascinated by the more mysterious emotions passers-by would display in front of us. I realised that if I didn't understand at least some of these mysterious things, then when the time came, I'd never be able to help my child as well as I should. So I began to seek out, on the sidewalks, inside the passing taxis, amidst the crowds waiting at the crossing, the sort of behaviour about which I needed to learn. Clara explains that Rosa has no empathy. Clara notices a fight in the street. Quote, They fought as though the most important thing was to damage each other as much as possible. Their faces were twisted into horrible shapes so that someone new might not even have realised they were people at all. And all the time they were punching each other, they shouted out cruel words. I love the fact that she talks about them looking like someone new. She's really switched onto the world. And it's almost human-like, but not quite. I, I do like Clara a lot as a character. She's so interesting the way she thinks about the world. Clara tests her empathetic skills, but it does stop at violence. Quote, I tried to feel in my own mind the anger the drivers had experienced. I tried to imagine me and Rosa getting so angry with each other we would start to fight like that, actually trying to damage each other's bodies. The idea seemed ridiculous, but I'd seen the taxi drivers, so I tried to find the beginnings of such a feeling in my mind. It was useless, though, and I'd always end up laughing at my own thoughts. And I'm just thinking at this point, is violence perhaps programmed out of her for safety? And... A big prediction, will this ultimately be her undoing, her sort of kryptonite, her major flaw, the fact that she isn't able to commit violence, so she's not able to save a character in the novel? It's a big prediction, and I'm probably going to be wrong, but let's find out. Clara recounts the tale of the coffee cup lady and the raincoat man, who presumably haven't seen each other for many years, and they embrace... And once again, Clara shows this great empathy. Listen to this. Quote, They seem so happy, I said, but it's strange because they also seem upset. She's talking to the manager. This is Clara. Oh, Clara, manager said quietly, you never miss a thing, do you? Perhaps they hadn't met for a long time, a long, long time. Perhaps when they last held each other like that, they were still young. Sometimes, she continues, at special moments like that, people feel a pain alongside their happiness. I'm glad you watch everything so carefully, Clara. Their manager was gone and Rosa said, how strange, what could she have meant? Never mind, Rosa, I said to her. She was just talking about the outside. Rosa began to discuss something else then, but I went on thinking about the coffee cup lady and her raincoat man and about what manager had said, and I tried to imagine how I would feel if Rosa and I, a long time from now, long after we'd found our different homes, saw each other again by chance on a street. Would I then feel, as manager had put it, pain alongside my happiness? The street really is Clara's education. Josie appears again, and Josie levels with Clara. She says to her, quote, Only thing is... Some days I'm not so well. I'm not sure what it is. I don't even know if it's something bad. But things sometimes get, well, unusual. Don't get me wrong. Most times you wouldn't feel it. But I wanted to be straight with you because you know how lousy it feels. People telling you how perfect things will be and they're not being straight. Clara is still happy to go with her, though. Clara has, I presume, some kind of momentary glitch in her vision which becomes divided into ten boxes... Clara and Rosa are then removed from the window. Boy AF Rex has been referred to as if he's never left the shop. And I'm thinking, was that glitch, her old consciousness, put into a new body while Jody, while Josie goes off with another Clara that she thinks was the Clara in the window? This is what I thought. But actually, this doesn't happen. But something 
quite bizarre does happen a cootings machine appears it's installed and generates smoke and i'm really not sure what it is and i guess the, what the author is doing is making me feel like i'm clara this is what it must be like i'm asking all these questions is it a generator some kind of technology that creates pollution and blocks the sun but i don't know what it is and clara doesn't know what it is either i feel just like clara Clara's vision seems to glitch into three panels again. And then a girl takes an interest in Clara, but the manager mentions that the new B3s are in and the father is so excited by the new attack that they move away from Clara. Clara is reprimanded for not showing an interest in the girl, basically because she wants to be taken in by Josie and no one else. Quote, and this is the manager speaking... Let me tell you something, Clara. Children make promises all the time. They come to the window. They promise all kinds of things. They promise to come back. They ask you not to let anyone else take you away. It happens all the time, but more often than not, the child never comes back. Or worse, the child comes back and ignores the poor AF who's waited and instead chooses another. It's just the way children are. You've been watching and learning so much, Clara. Well, here's another lesson for you. Rosa is bought... So I'm going to abandon the consciousness swapping idea. The new B3 seem to separate themselves cunningly from the older AFs. And Clara is allowed to go in the shop window for six days and given a, quote, special price too. And the manager says, I'll make sure you find a home. And then Clara is demoted to the back alcove. And Josie enters. She can't find Clara at first, but finally she does find her and she's desperate for her the mother questions clara and asks her to reproduce josie's walk and she does so and this is an interesting theme that comes up quite a lot in the book the mother wanting clara to reproduce josie clara comments that josie had become thinner and josie also has a limp i wonder what medical condition or impairment josie has and how clara will help her Then the narrative moves into part two, which is at Josie and the mother's home. She thinks constantly about the changing layouts of the kitchen. And Clara mentions, quote, in those early days when Josie was strong. So Josie is clearly unwell. Clara slowly learns her role. Melania, housekeeper, is quite anti these AFs. Quote, it seems obvious that her hostility had to do with her larger fears concerning what might be happening around Josie. I also think that maybe Clara is naive in thinking that. I think she is fearful of her job being replaced by Clara, perhaps. There's some banter between Josie and the mother. Quote, and this is Josie speaking, Mum, me drawing in colour is like you playing that cello, in fact, worse. And mother says, I have to admit, my cello playing, even at its glorious best, sounded like Dracula's grandmother. But your use of colour is more like, well, a pond on a summer's evening. Something like that. You do beautiful things with colour, Josie. Things no one else even thought about. I love those two metaphors. Dracula's grandmother. Clara is getting there with metaphor. They watch the sunset over the three fields and Clara says... The grass was tall in all three fields, and when the wind blew, it would move as if invisible passers-by were hurrying through it. Not quite as good as the Dracula's grandmother metaphor, but she's definitely, I think, getting there with metaphor. It's very practical, isn't it? It's based on Clara's actual sense learning. Is Clara developing some kind of imagination, perhaps? Clara certainly can equate colours of things in her experience to other things, like the sky... Quote, when Josie wasn't well, it could turn the colour of her vomit or her pale faeces or even develop streaks of blood. Sometimes the sky would become divided into a series of squares, each one a different shade of purple to its neighbour. That's a heartbreaking comparison to the symptoms of Josie's illness. Clara is also not aware of the strange squares, the glitch which is occurring or, or is part of her vision. Both these factors highlight Clara's fundamental naivety, I think. Clara naively believes also that the sun may rest in Mr McBain's barn, the barn that she can see on the horizon. Josie mentions to her Rick, her best friend, and she says, quote, I can't wait for you two to meet. 
After Clara's lessons on her oblong, that's her mobile phone, with Professor Helm, Clara goes outside with Melania, the housekeeper, and Josie for the first time ever. They see Rick flying remote control birds, and it appears to Clara that Rick and Josie have a very close relationship. Rick is clearly concerned that Josie has an AF. Quote, you said you'd never get an AF, he said. Well, I changed my mind, okay? Anyway, Clara's not any AF. Hey, Clara, say something to Rick. You said you'd never get one. Come on, Rick. We don't do everything we said when we were small. Why shouldn't I have an AF? He's obviously a bit miffed about the fact that she's got an AF. Clara studies Rick's house. Quote, Rick's house was smaller and not just because it was further away. I love that robotic little touch there. It too had been built from wooden planks, but its structure was more simple. A single box, taller than it was wide, standing in the grass. Josie has invited Rick to a meeting, but he is unsure. The meeting is what's known as an interaction meeting, so that Josie can socialise with her peers in preparation for college. And I think this is really relevant today, the whole online learning thing. Having come out of lockdown, the keenness and interest in our children socialising is really relevant for their well-being. Josie is not looking forward to this interaction meeting. Rick arrives and Clara notices other parents are friendly but cautious. And there do seem to be not that many real life men, apart from the beggar man in the uh, street and the professors on the mobile phones for the teaching. And it's interesting why that might be. And I'm thinking, who is this Sal person that's talked about constantly? I feel like Clara. I think... There's a lot that we need to find out about Sal. Rick has obviously missed out on something, perhaps college and perhaps a wife. I'm not quite sure at this stage. Again, it's a great mystery. He's obviously missed out on something. Quote, then a large woman whose shape resembled the food blending machine. I love that comparison. Said, seems so bright too. Such a shame. A boy like that should have missed out. And she's talking about Rick. I wouldn't even have known, another voice said. He presents himself so well. Is that a British accent he has? What's important, the food blending woman said, is that this next generation learn how to be comfortable with every sort of person. That's what Peter always says. Then as other voices murmured in agreement, she asked the mother, did his folks just decide not to go ahead, lose their nerve? The mother's kind smile vanished and everyone who'd heard seemed to stop talking. The food blending woman herself froze in horror. Then she reached out a hand towards the mother. Oh, Chrissy, what did I say? I didn't mean... It's okay, the mother said. Please forget it. Oh, Chrissy, I'm so sorry. I'm so stupid sometimes. I only meant... It's our worst fear, a firmer voice nearby said. Every one of us here. It's okay, the mother said. Let's leave it. Chrissy, the food blending woman, said, I only meant a nice boy like that. Some of us were lucky, some of us weren't. A black-skinned woman, saying this, stepped forward and touched the mother's shoulder kindly. But Josie's fine now, isn't she? Another voice asked. She looks so much better. She has good days and bad, the mother said. She's looking so much better. The food blending woman said, She's going to be just fine. I know it. You are so courageous. After all you've been through, Josie will be really grateful to you one day. As I say, I love this comparison to a food blender. It's very unusual simile. These meetings may be for some mate selection, I'm thinking. I just don't quite know yet. And Clara overhears the conversation of the women. There appears to be three boys and three girls at the meeting. A boy called Danny grabs Clara and Scrub wants him to push her to, quote, test her coordination. So I'm thinking this meeting feels like it would be if I were an AF. I don't understand what's going on, what is happening. It's very destabilising, not quite knowing exactly what the meeting's about. So the children want to test whether Clara, a B2 model, is as good as a B3 model. Danny wants to throw Carla to test her coordination, as I say. But Rick steps in, noticing a soft toy in Danny's pocket. And he kind of makes fun of Danny for this soft toy. And another parent intercedes and the other kids file out, leaving Rick with Clara on his own. And Clara says to Rick, thank you very much. Rick feels very out of place. Quote, this is Rick talking. I suppose they have a point though, he said. I don't belong here. This is a meeting for lifted kids. Lifted kids, what are they? Is it some kind of caste system based on college? 
Are they given an education drug? Maybe something that has harmed Josie? Josie and Rick have, quote, a plan for a future together. And Clara reflects that Josie changes according to certain social situations. Quote, These were helpful lessons for me. Not only had I learned that changes were a part of Josie and that I should be ready to accommodate them, I'd begun to understand also that this wasn't a trait peculiar just to Josie, that people often felt the need to prepare a side of themselves to display to passers-by, as they might in a store window, and that such a display needn't be taken so seriously once the moment had passed. Very interesting, she's relating her past experience to the current situation. Clara recounts when their friendship became less warm. The mother promises to take Josie to Morgan Falls with Clara if, quote, she gets well. And what pressure is that? Wow. Josie then shows Clara some photos of Morgan Falls. And she mentions she had a sister, Sal, who died. So there's the question about who was this Sal character. We find out it's the sister who's died. And when Josie goes to bed, the mother praises Clara for her good work. She comments on how the lack of reflective memory must be a good thing for Clara to have. Quote, and this is mother talking, Clara, are you happy here? Clara responds with, yes, of course. Mother says, curious thing to ask an AF, in fact, I don't even know if that question makes sense. Do you miss that store? And Clara responds with, I sometimes think about the store, the view from the window, the other AFs, but not often. I'm very pleased to be here. The mother looked at me for a moment, then she said, it must be great not to miss things, not to long to get back to something, not to be looking back all the time. Everything must be so much more... She paused, and she doesn't actually finish off that sentence. So at this point, I'm thinking, how will this less warm friendship happen? Maybe she just doesn't wake her up thinking that she's unwell, and so she misses the trip. We will find out. So Clara notices some danger topics at breakfast. Quote, When I was still new in the house, I believed there were particular danger topics for Josie, and if only the mother could be prevented from finding roots to these topics, the Sunday breakfast would remain comfortable. But on further observation, I saw that even if the danger topics were avoided... Topics like Josie's education assignments or her social interaction scores, the uncomfortable feeling can still be there because it really had to do with something beneath these topics, that the danger topics were themselves ways the mother had devised to make certain emotions appear inside Josie's mind. So I became concerned when, on that Sunday morning of the trip to Morgan Falls, the mother asked Josie why she liked to play a particular oblong game in which the characters continually died in car accidents. Going forward, Clara gets into the car for the first time and the mother accuses Josie of, quote, being sick and trying to hide it. And then there's a row that ensues and the mother ends up taking Clara to the falls on her own while Melania, housekeeper, looks after sick Josie at home. The mum doesn't seem very nice or fair to Josie at this point at all. The mother makes very insensitive remarks to Clara, again about feelings. Listen to this, quote, It must be nice sometimes to have no feelings. I envy you. I consider this, this is Clara, then said, I believe I have many feelings. The more I observe, the more feelings become available to me. The mother laughed unexpectedly, making me start. In that case, she said, maybe you shouldn't be so keen to observe. Then she added, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be rude. I'm sure you have all sorts of feelings. Clara says, when Josie was unable to come with us just now, I felt sadness. The mother responds with, you felt sadness, okay. She became silent, perhaps to concentrate on her driving and the cars coming in the opposite direction. On the drive to the falls, we learn that Mother is separated from Josie's father amicably. He used to work at Kimball Refrigeration. Quote, clean energy in, clean energy out. Although now it is nothing to do with refrigeration. It reminds Clara a little bit of the Cootings machine from part one. Clara sees a bull and is shocked into halting. Quote, I'd never seen before anything that gave all at once so many signals of anger and the wish to destroy. Its face, its horns, its cold eyes watching me all brought fear into my mind, but I felt something more, something stranger and deeper. At that moment, it felt to me some great error had been made that the creature should be allowed to stand in the sun's pattern at all, that this bull belonged somewhere deep in the ground, far within the mud and darkness, and its presence on the grass could only have awful consequences." It's okay, the mother said. He can't touch us. Now come on, I need a coffee. 
That's how I feel when I see bulls sometimes. There's something malevolent about them. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of bulls either. Clara mentions that she's sorry about Sal's death and is reprimanded when she inquires, quote, why Sal passed away. And then the mother asks Clara to emulate Josie again. And it's very moving. Clara is talking like she's Josie. Listen to this voice. Hi, Mum. Nothing to worry about, right? I got here and I'm fine. It's okay, Mum. Don't worry. I'll get well soon. I know how it will happen too. What, says the mother? What are you saying? You think you know more than the doctors, more than I do? Your sister made promises too, but she couldn't keep them. Don't you do the same? But Mum, Sal was sick with something different. I'm going to get well. Okay, Josie, so tell me how you'll get well. There's special help coming. Something no one's thought of yet. Then I'll be well again. What is this? Who's this talking? Now, in box after box, I could see the cheekbones of the mother's face very pronounced beneath her skin. Really, Mum, I'm going to be fine. That's enough. Enough, says the mother. The mother stood up and walked away. So will there be a medicine to fix Josie? Maybe Clara does know something. They journey back and Clara sees sheep, quote, filled with kindness, the exact opposite of the bull. And mother says to Clara, it's best we say nothing to Josie about this trip. And it appears that the mother is lonely. She wants to go on future trips with Clara. Quote, you don't mind, do you, Clara, if we do something like this again? The mother believes Josie is becoming more, quote, considerate with Clara around. And Clara does not confirm, but just says, quote, I'm glad. Clara apologises for the possibility of upsetting Josie by going on the trip with mother alone. Something has shifted. Clara says, I'm very sorry if I did something to upset you, Josie. So we're still good friends? And Josie replies with, you're my AF, so we must be good friends, right? But there was no smile in her voice. It was clear she wished to be alone to get on with her sketching. So I left the room to stand outside on the landing. And then we go into part three. So Clara muses as to whether the, quote, shadows of the Morgan Falls trip may have been less if she was a B3. Because the kids at the interaction party were taunting her for not being more up to date. Remember that B3 was more up to date model. Josie's health collapses and Melania housekeeper sends Clara out of the house in some irritation. Quote, AF, you behind me all the time, creep me out, go outdoors. Clara wonders why the sun doesn't help Josie, quote, like it did the beggar man. Quote, I'd first expected the son to help Josie in the days when she'd become weak before Morgan falls. I'd then accepted that he'd perhaps been correct at that point to wait. But now with Josie so much weaker and so many things concerning her future in uncertainty, it was puzzling why he continued to delay. I could understand that for all his kindness, the son was very busy, that there were many people besides Josie who required his attention, that even the son could be expected to miss individual cases like Josie, especially if she appeared well looked after by a mother, a housekeeper and an AF. The idea came into my mind then that for her to receive the son's special help, it might be necessary to draw his attention to Josie's situation in some particular and noticeable way. There's this almost religious quality to the son. Quote, I thought too about the time the son had given his special nourishment to beggar man and his dog and considering the important differences between his circumstances and Josie's. For one thing, many passers-by had known beggar man and when he'd become weak, he'd done so in a busy street visible to taxi drivers and runners. Any of these people might have drawn the son's attention to his condition and that of the dog. Even more significantly, I remembered what had been happening not long before the son had given his special nourishment to beggar man. The Cootings machine had been making its awful pollution, obliging even the son to retreat for a time, and it had been during the fresh new era, after the dreadful machine had gone away, that the son, relieved and full of happiness, had given his special help. This religious quality of the son. And what will this special help be? How is Clara going to get this special help? Clara believes she is to draw the attention of Josie to the sun. And I'm going to look at that in more depth, this idea of conspiracy theories. Clara is the biggest conspiracy theorist out there. Rick visits ill Josie and Melania housekeeper says to Clara, stay in there, make sure no hanky-panky. And Rick and Clara play this game called the bubble game where Josie draws pictures with speech bubbles and Rick fills them in with some text. And we learn that Rick is jealous of the portrait that's being made of Josie 
and occasionally they discuss something called, quote, their plan. And this, I think, is going to be their future together. That's their idea, their plan. Um, there's more playing of the bubble game and Josie questions a picture after Rick has gone. She discusses this with Clara and what his comments might mean. Rick has noticed that Josie, quote, changes around certain people or groups, just as Clara noticed that. Rick comes back on another day and Josie guesses why Rick's mum didn't get him lifted. Quote, I think your mum never went ahead with you because she wanted to keep you for herself. And now it's too late. Josie wants him to study harder, to try to get to Atlas Brookings so that his unliftedness doesn't get in the way of their plan. So they're called unlifted. Quote, and this is Josie speaking, but you're smarter than any of the other unlifteds trying to get in, so why won't you go for it? I'll tell you, it's because your mum wants you to stay with her forever. She doesn't want you going out there and turning into a real adult. And then they argue over a bubble picture where Rick writes... Quote, I wish I could go out and walk and run and skateboard and swim in lakes, but I can't because my mother has courage. So instead I get to stay in bed and be sick. I'm glad about this. I really am. And then Rick storms out, throwing the picture onto her bed and then have a long held argument. Rick doesn't come for days. Clara wishes the son could give some special help to Josie. And Josie writes Rick a letter and Clara offers to take it to Rick's. I'm thinking, how would Clara cope outside on her own? But she does. She manages to get to Rick's without any hitch. It is a very unkempt house, and Rick's mum is very ill. Clara says, quote, I think she believes Rick's mother is reluctant to let Rick go because she fears the loneliness that would result for her. And Rick says, Josie's always trying to trap me now. You must have heard she's always doing it now. Either she accuses me of thinking about that stuff too much or she's offended because I don't think about her enough in that way. Always trapping me. Whatever I say, she claims I'm always lusting after these girls I can see on my DS. Then the next time she brings it up and I don't react, she says there's something wrong with me. I'm not being natural. She keeps talking about how we knew each other too well when we were children and so the whole sex thing might not even work with us. Whatever I try to do or say, it's wrong and I get trapped. And the way she goes on about mum is going too far. Plan or no plan, that's just not fair. Clara thinks that now it's the time to act in order to ensure Josie does not, quote, pass away. Clara's plan to save Josie involves going to Rick's barn Basically, I think Clara thinks that that is where the son lives. I think she's that naive. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty certain that she thinks that the son is living in Rick's barn. And that if she can somehow harness the son, she can make Clara better. Rick says how to get there. And Miss Helen, Rick's mum, makes an appearance. Quote, one never knows how to greet a guest like you. After all, are you a guest at all? Or do I treat you like a vacuum cleaner? I suppose I did as much just now. I'm sorry. Very funny. Very poignant. Makes me think I'm never going to be rude to Alexa again after hearing that. Treating her like a vacuum cleaner. Miss Helen explains that getting tutors for uplifted kids is quite difficult or too expensive. And Rick's protestations make her fall short of asking Clara to tutor him. Miss Helen says she saw Chrissy, which is Josie's mum, in the tall grass holding back Sal two years after her supposed death. And Rick objects, saying, Mum wasn't perhaps in the best condition that day to see things accurately. And Miss Helen does say, quote, Sal passed away, it was a great tragedy, and we shan't play foolish games with her memory. What I'm saying is that the person I saw trying to run away from Chrissy looked like Sal. That was all I said. So again, maybe the mother has been employing an AF to pose in a manner like Sal. Perhaps that AF is still around somewhere, who knows? Miss Helen reminisces on England. Quote, I do miss England. In particular, I miss the hedges. In England, the part of it I'm from anyway, you can see green all around you and always divided by hedges. Hedges, hedges everywhere. So ordered. Now look out there. It just goes on and on. I suppose there are fences somewhere in the midst of it all, but who can tell? She became quiet. So I said, I believe there are indeed fences. It's really three separate fields, fences dividing them. You can tear down a fence in a moment, she said, then put up another somewhere else. Change the entire configuration of the land in a day or two. A land of fences is so temporary. That's the nice thing about England. Hedges give a sense of history properly set down in the land. 
And then contrary to what Josie believes, Rick's mum wants desperately for Rick to go to Atlas Brookings. Quote, he's convinced himself he can't go away and leave me here. Of course, I can manage perfectly well, but he likes to pretend I'm quite helpless, likely to get up to all sorts of mischief in his absence. He's convinced an hour is about as much as he can leave me on my own. Now, how will he grow up and go out into the world if he can't leave me for more than an hour at a time? So Josie was wrong. Miss Helen has a, quote, secret weapon that she doesn't reveal to us. Quote, I have a secret weapon, a contact. Perhaps the next time Chrissy takes Josie into the city, perhaps when she next sits for her portrait, Rick and I could catch a ride. Then Rick could meet my secret weapon, hopefully impress him. Chrissy and I have already spoken about it, but all of this is useless until Rick changes his attitude. And poor Clara is desperate to help Josie. Quote, and this is Rick talking. You were saying how you wanted to go out to that barn for some reason. And Clara says, yes, and it will have to be in the evening. It's essential to time such a trip accurately. This makes me more and more convinced that Clara wants to harness the energy of the sun in some way. It reminds me of that awful blunder of that driverless car that thought a white lorry was the sun and ploughed straight into it, killing the occupant. Just that naive awfulness of technology, naivety in technology that causes chaos it's quite a scary idea this sort of misunderstanding of the world so halfway questions well what is that secret weapon of miss helen's will clara find a cure for josie mm, i don't think she will it will probably lead to clara's possible demise will josie get better i'm hopeful that she will will rick get to atlas brookings I really hope so. Perhaps with Clara's help, he will. Will the mother continue to ask Clara to emulate Josie? And will the person in the cornfield that Miss Helen saw prove to be another AF? And if so, where is that AF? Will we find out if Clara can read? I'm sure she can. She'll probably be helping Rick with his homework. She probably can, especially after Miss Helen's conversation. And will Clara's inability to inflict violence be her downfall? Possibly. I'm not sure. That could be stretching it. It could lead to someone else's downfall. And will we ever find out what that Cootings machine is? Probably not. It represents tech. And will we learn why uplifted children sometimes get sick? Hopefully we will. And will Clara's naive belief that the sun can be harnessed lead to anyone's destruction? Well, possibly Clara's destruction. Will Rick and Josie's plan work out? I hope so. I want them to be together. So there's some interesting questions. There's some very interesting ideas as well. I'm just going to go through some of them in no particular order. So there's this unquestioning faith in technology. The mother, for example, asking whether Clara may know of a cure for Josie. That was very moving. Quote, you're an intelligent AF. Maybe you can see things the rest of us can't. Maybe you're right to be hopeful. Maybe you're right. Conspiracy theories. They arise in Clara because of her single point of view. She has very little empirical knowledge. Just the knowledge needed to be a good AF. Quote, I thought too about the time the son had given his special nourishment to beggar man and his dog and considered the important differences between his circumstances and Josie's. The diction's really interesting in the novel. Clara doesn't say you, she says Josie. And we have lots of proper nouns, for example, oblong for mobile phones, the RPO building, the fire escapes building, red shelves, glass table, front alcove, striped sofa, overhaul men, the island in the kitchen, open plan, the largest room in the house. Empathy is an interesting theme and the limits of empathy. Clara can't empathise with the idea of physical violence, which we've looked at already. There's an interesting idea of this learning from watching and seeing and observing and the limits to that. So Clara watching the street, she does learn an awful lot, but then she's limited because she sees the sun descending into McBain's barn and I think that's going to be her downfall. There's the interesting idea of a moral programming or the religion. For example, goodness being in the sun and the sun personified when she says his kindness. There's also this idea of human rudeness to AIs and very unsympathetic for example the mother's response at the solar absorption problem she's very rude to clara 
there's an interesting theme of class and prejudice. The high-ranking mum, so we've got these pre-programmed responses in Clara. Quote, a girl came in with her mother. I wasn't so good then at telling ages, but I remember estimating 13 and a half for the girl. And I think now that was correct. The mother was an office worker and from her shoes and suit, we could tell she was high ranking. And then the idea that Rex is a B2 with solar absorption problems, not the more superior B3s. So just like humans, AFs also have a class I really like the idea of this precise estimation, the 13 and a half years of the girl, or the 15 and a half years, and the fear of the loss of sun. They're desperate to find the sun and the concern that it might hide, leading to lack of nourishment, is obviously hardwired into them to be a really serious threat. There's obviously a lot of ideas about technology, the excitement of newer tech. Remember the man who comes in? Quote, but they have the new B3s in, honey. Don't you just want to look at those? No one you know has one of those. And you see so many people like that nowadays wanting the newest, latest tech. And then Clara's visual system works in a series of boxes, which is very interesting. Quote, just beyond the tables was the waterfall. It was larger and fiercer than the one I'd seen in the magazine, filling eight boxes just by itself. And then when she talks about music, she can hear just electronic sounds rather than music. So some interesting ideas to come out of this first half, which, as I hope you can tell, I'm enjoying very much. I'd like to share some of your thoughts on last month's book, The Offing. There were some diverging comments on the web and on Goodreads. Nigel B said, quote, There's so much to enjoy in this book that I raced through it. I intend to read it again more slowly. By the end, I had a tear in my eye and a lump in my throat. And Paul said... Quote, the writing is beautiful and evocative, describing a summer long gone but always remembered. The character of Dulcie is memorable and refreshing, open and non-judgmental. This is a wonderful novel. Eric was also very positive. Quote, Myers presents in this beautiful tale conversations which cross borders of class, gender, sexuality and nationality to speak about the importance of preserving our individual voice and creative spirit, especially during times of political strife. And then there were some more critical comments. Sean didn't like the, quote, nouns laden with adjectives laden with adverbs. And one reviewer said, quote, The initial section with a young boy wandering the English countryside made me instantly compare this book to the Tim Peer's West Country trilogy, specifically the middle book, The Wanderers, that I'd recently read. Unfortunately, I found myself longing for the spare, concise, show-don't-tell writing style of Tim Peer's instead of the flowery nonsense here. And Emily said, and well, to sum up, the story is trite. I didn't believe it for a second. An unbelievable story isn't always a problem. See much of great literature. But combined with overwritten prose, unconvincing characters, gratuitous shoehorning in of historical lessons on the eve of Brexit and historical inaccuracies, it became one. And personally, after reflecting on the book for a couple of weeks, I tend to agree with the positive and the negative comments. The book had some very verbose description. It got really exciting and interesting towards the middle half, but then fell away in the last half. There were undoubtedly some very expressive, beautiful words written about the natural landscape in it. Thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Email bookshook at yahoo.com or leave a comment at the Bookshook YouTube channel. I'd also love suggestions for future books to read together. Maybe there's been one sitting on your shelf for ages which you haven't got round to reading and you just need that push to get started. Talking of next books, after I publish part two of Clara and the Sun on the last Friday of this month, that's the 30th, August Read will be Sugar Bane by Douglas Stewart. I know nothing about it apart from it won the 2020 Booker Prize, so get that one ready if you can. Anyway, I look forward to discussing the final part of Clara and the Sun at the next episode. See you then. Mm-hmm.